So uh, hello everyone. Good evening for those of you based in Israel and good morning and good afternoon to those of you based in the East Coast and in the West Coast. It's great to see so many of you with us. My name is Maya Fona and I'm part of the JFN staff in Israel, focusing on program and content development. And joining me today here is uh, Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs from the New York office. Tamar, you can wave. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. We were both involved uh, in the planning of this program. We're so happy for all of you to be joining us today for this program on religious Zionism in Israel. I'm excited about today's program for many reasons, one of which is that the initiative for creating it came from David Roth, a longtime JFN member who invited us to dive into one of his main areas of giving and learn more about it. It's always nice to do a program that comes from a member. Joining us today also from our JFN community are Ruthie Saragosti, who is the planning director from the Israel UJA Federation of New York. David Roth, I mentioned, he's the executive director of the Urano Foundation. And journalist Yair Ettinger, author of the book Unraveled, who will be introduced shortly by David. Um, we, will be, we will hear from all three of our speakers, and then they will form a panel where you will, will be able to ask them questions yourself, or you can uh, write them in the chat, and I will ask them for you during the panel. I want to encourage you to write the questions as they come up in the chat. And without further ado, I'm passing the mic microphone to David. So hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Roth. I was born and raised in Syracuse, New York, and made Aliyah in 1987 after high school. I live in Jerusalem with my wife, Talia, and my four children. I'm the executive director of the Arena Foundation and also consult to other funders and nonprofits. I have been a longstanding and active member in the Jewish Funders Network and the Form of Foundations in Israel, and I am happy to be here with you today. The Arena Foundation is a private family American grant-making foundation established in 1991. I have served as its executive director since late 1997. The foundation had several funding areas over the years, but already from its beginning, it supported a few modern Orthodox educational institutions in Israel. A little over a decade ago, the foundation carried out a strategic planning process wherein it decided to narrow its mission to focus on promoting a moderate worldview among the religious Zionist sector in Israel with a focus on democracy, social justice, women's empowerment, religion and state, and the relationship to the other. This was based on a belief that Israel's religious Zionist sector has the potential to play a significant role in fostering Jewish unity and a shared Jewish identity among Israeli Jews. To do so, we feel the religious Zionist sector needs to be empowered, strengthened, and ultimately project a liberal voice that promotes the blending of traditional Jewish law and faith with a priori engagement with the modern world. Failure to reach this potential by our rationale could lead to negative outcomes and that the religious Zionist sector would be defined by its most extreme elements. I have been a member of JFN for a very long time. I am appreciative that the Haredi, Arab Israeli, Mizrahi, social and geographic periphery, and various Salim communities have benefited from philanthropic support. Yet the one tribe, quote unquote, that has been overlooked by many is the religious Zionist sector. While so many funders care about Jewish unity and a shared identity among Israeli Jews, most funders have not recognized this subsector as a potential bridge that can play a key role. For others, perhaps there is a reticence to engage with a sector that has historically been associated with the settlement movement and the chief rabbinate. When one takes a closer look, however, one finds nuance, complexity, and challenges as the different sides of the sector engage in the struggle of how to find the right balance between adherence to Torah and engaging with the modern world. Recent political developments merely strengthen the relevance and importance of taking a look at what is going on under the hood within the religious Zionist sector in Israel. Finally, while we are extremely grateful to several other foundations that have begun to also fund in this field, we believe that the needs far outweigh the availability of philanthropic funds. We recognize the lack of good English resources that would be helpful for the global Jewish community to understand the nuances of the religious Zionist sector. The Orena Foundation therefore decided to fund the English publication of Yair Ettinger's book, Prumim, with Koran Publishers, which should hopefully be released in late 2022. We are doing this for two reasons. One, to generate awareness and a nuanced understanding of the issues in the religious Zionist sector 
and how they are of concern to the Jewish world and Israeli society, and two, to potentially encourage funders to get involved in this field. The book will be distributed free of charge to the funder community and professionals working in Jewish organizations in English-speaking countries, in addition to being sold in bookstores and online. It is now my honor to introduce you to our main speaker, Yair Ettinger. Yair is an Israeli journalist, a correspondent and commentator for Khan, the Israeli Public Broadcasting Corporation. His work primarily focuses on religion affairs, the religious and Haredi communities and their politics, and U.S. Jewry. In 2019, he published his book, Prumim, Unraveled by Dvir Publishers, on the religious Zionist community in Israel and its current ideological and social disputes. Yair, Havakasha. Okay, you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> David and Maya, and uh, everyone to uh, to come here and listen uh, um, and and to participate in this evening. And I would like to uh, to start with a minor, tiny question: um, What is the main <clears throat> fault line dividing the Israeli society? Well. If you look at the Israeli society and many journalists, historians, uh, academic uh, politicians along the year gave different uh, ways, uh, different angles or different uh, observation of the Israeli society, the Israeli politics. Usually it would be um, a majority and minority, maybe uh, ethnic uh, on the ethnic basis, uh, Arab, Arab and Jews. Um, left and right, and then the question of um, of, of the occupation, uh, what uh, and the peace peace process, uh, Mizrahim and Ashkenazim, um, and other other ways of, of looking at the Israeli society. On on 2015, President Ruby Rivlin gave a different a different observation, and that was the 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 four tribes speech of the Israeli society. He looked at the Israeli society not as a minor minority and majority, but as four minorities uh, living together, struggling sometimes, and the need of all of them to, to, to live together. It was the, the Arab Israelis, the Arab citizens of Israel, the Tzionud Datit, religious Zionists, and Haredim, and secular non-religious uh, society and the division is taking uh, taking into consideration um, politics, ideology, but also ethnical ethnic the ethnic basis. Um, what I would like to suggest, all these answers I think are correct, are still valid in many ways, but I would like to offer a new way to look at the Israeli society nowadays. And the Israeli society, and mainly the Israeli politics, is um, <clears throat> the, main, the main fault line within the Israeli politics is Jewish, Ju Judaism, the Jewish identity. Jewish identity is now in the center of the Israeli uh, politics, Israeli um, political parties, and uh, the Israeli uh, divisions. And what I would like to suggest is that this, uh, this uh, uh, friction, this rift within the Israeli politics begins with Tzionud Datit, begins with one minority, which is the Datim Lumim, the national religious uh, uh, minority, which is, depends how you count, between 10% and 22% uh, of the Jewish Israeli society, uh, which now are in many ways, the new elite of the Israeli society, mainly because the prime minister, Naftali Bennett, comes from this, um, from this uh, society. Um, and uh, okay, so let's start with, with the new, uh, with the news actually, with the actual news, um, latest news from the Israeli government. The Israeli government passed a law just two and a half weeks ago uh, regarding kashrut, regarding giving the certificate of kashrut on food. This is a major reform by Minister 
Matan Kahana. Minister Matan Kahana is a member of Naftali Bennett's party and he's a good friend of Naftali Bennett as well. And he, uh, at, at the moment he, he came into office as the, the, the minister for religious issue, religion and state, um, he, uh, he started to, to move towards this reform. This reform uh, looks like a technical thing, a technical thing saying that from now on, from now on, um, the, the chief rabbinate is not the only, uh, the only organization that can provide kashrut. Looks like a technical thing. Uh, it, the, the, there is a possibility from now on for private organization, private organizations also to offer kashrut to restaurants, shops, supermarkets, not only the chief rabbinate, which is a monopoly since the beginning of the state of Israel, not only the chief rabbinate, but also private organizations. Now, this looks like a technical thing, but it's a very, it's a dramatic thing. It's a dramatic thing because it breaks the monopoly of the chief rabbinate. And it says from the, for the first time uh, since the beginning of, since the establishment of the state of Israel, that the, could, that the chief rabbinate is not the only organization uh, responsible over halacha, over the Jewish law. There, are, there could be some private organization doing that. Let me just say that in many ways, in fact, this is the situation already today because uh, private organizations from the Haredi community are giving kashrut for dozens of years, but from, from now on, this is, it's possible for, uh, for other, uh, it's, it's, it's official, that the competition is official. And there is a new notion, a new notion, a totally new notion in uh, religion and state, which is uh, competition. And in many ways, privatization. Privatization, this is a key uh, notion to understand what's going on right now in religion and state issues and in, in religion in general. Um, now, the, the, the reactions for this dramatic move um, were expected and, and Nathan Kahana, the, the Minister for Religious uh, uh, Services, he is, uh, he is a goal for daily attacks every day uh, for the, actually for the, for the last month th since he, he, try, he, he started to move his reform. Um, people say, people look at him, not only people from the Haredi parties, in, in mainly Haredi parties, but not only, also some religious Zionist parties, and I will, will relate to that later, um, they regard Matan Kahana and his reform, not only as a political challenge, mm -hmm. but as a religious challenge. He's not a political rival. If you want, he's a religious rival because he says something which is quite, quite revolutionary, which is that religion is not, it couldn't be uh, focused on one organization. And the chief rabbinate of Israel, which was uh, not only uh, uh, statutoric um, uh, uh, ministry uh, in a way, but it was also a symbol in many ways for the religious Zionist uh, community. It was a symbol, a may maybe even a theological symbol since the days of Rabbi Abraham Yitzchak Kohen Kuk, which established the chief rabbinate 100 years ago, so this symbol is not holy anymore. This some symbol, okay, we're not, he, it's still there. It could provide kashrut as well as other services, but it's not the only one. And what I, what I tried to, what, what I will say here is that this move of Matan Kahana, which is the first move in many moves that he plans, reflects trends, processes that been going on for many years 
in the religious Zionist community. And uh, he didn't start that from, from a scratch. He didn't just showed up uh, five months ago and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and offered his reform. This all came from other processes within the uh, religious, religious Zionist community. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the religious Zionist community. Um, this is my book, Pro Meme. Pro Meme is a is is a game of words a little bit because many many people from uh, from America, by the way, and people who knows a little bit of Yiddish, um, read that as frooms, frooms, pro meme, but it means actually the the main goal is uh, to look at the at the religious Zionist community as not only the knitted kippah, but the knitted kippah is getting unraveled. And there are many directions for this, uh, for this community um, um, to, um, to act as um, many ideological, uh, many ideological, um, I would say, movements within that, this community. This is no longer one united, solid, or uh, mon monolithic uh, ideology, ideological community. There are many ways. And what I tried to say in that book is that for many years, the, the religious Zionist community devoted itself for, I would say, one main, main reason or the main, main goal, which was the settlements. The, the, the building the settlements for many years. And I would say in the last 15 years, um, after there was, even, even though there, the, the, the argument or the discussion, the dispute within the Israeli society and mainly within the Tzionut Datit regarding settlements is a little bit, I would say there is a, a consensus regarding the settlements, like it or not, other disputes came into the surface, other disputes. And the disputes, what I, what I try to say is that disputes are in the religious fields, cultural fields, uh, and mainly I would say in two tracks, two main tracks. One track is the track of authority of the rabbis, authority of the rabbinate, and on the other side, being a religious halachic person and still be autonomous in many ways. And the other one, maybe even more important, is woman. The woman breaking the ceiling of, uh, of religious community, religious life. And what we see right now on the surface, on the political surface, is just the, the, the the, the end or the tip or the just the what we see on, on the surface is uh, an expression of things that are happening for many years, not in the political arena, but in communities, in synagogues, in yeshivot, schools, uh, um, in, in, uh, in, um, in, the, in the urban life, urban life of being religious, orthodox religious in Israel, um, and uh, in in, uh, in in many ways, I, I will just uh, I will relate to some uh, some of them. Um, so um, so th this is the book, by the way. I mean that's that's the book, uh, and that's uh, the the disputes that divide the, the religious Zionism, um, and it's it's. I'm talking about what happens right now, right now in the, in, in the, fa in the past uh, uh, 20, 15, 20 years. And uh, for instance, what, what I do is diving deep into the disputes, trying to, 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 uh, to, uh, to explore or to examine each and every one or the, the, main, the main disputes within the religious Zionism. Most of them are cultural, such as Woman role in synagogues, um, um, the I would say avant-garde synagogues that showed up in Israel during the past twenty years, 
uh, egalitarians, egalitarian minions within the modern orthodoxy in Israel and as well as in America. Um, the question of LGBT inside the Jewish, the, the Orthodox community. Question of, uh, for instance, of uh, very interesting question is the question of recruiting women, religious women, religious young women into the army. This is a major question. For instance, I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, I will touch that. Um, um, for instance, this issue is being uh, a subject to a psakalacha of the chief rabbinate. Psakalacha of the chief rabbinate that forbids the recruitment of young uh, religious Zionist uh, girls into the army. And in fact, in the sur on the surface, there is a quiet rebellion against that ruling for in uh, that ruling and also against the main uh, the mainstream um, I would say institution mainstream uh, educators rabbis that forbids that and young women or young uh, girls going to the army even though it's considered to be uh, a taboo for many years in the uh, religious Zionist community. Um, and other, other, um, um, other trends are uh, what I call religious or halachic activists. Halachic activists, for instance, the kashrut thing, the kashrut thing didn't came, came out from, from nothing. There was for, for many years, there was, uh, there was uh, experiments, I would say, here in Jerusalem, here in Jerusalem, in, in many cafes and in few cafes and restaurants trying to offer kashrut, even though it was illegal, even though it was illegal to offer kashrut outside of the rabbinate. Outside of the rabbinate, these, uh, there's a group of people, a group of activists who challenged the rabbinate, took it to the court, to the Supreme Court. Some, in some cases they won, some cases they lost, but now we see that the reform, the dramatic reform that uh, done by Matan Kahana is not, it, it, it came from that ideas, from these ideas, from a uh, few, a group of, uh, a small group of activists who, who said, we're not, we're not accepting anymore the monopoly on religion. We would like to have privatization in many ways. There are few ways to be, uh, religious and maybe even uh, and and keep halacha not under the the chief rabbinate. Uh, now Matan Kahana, which uh, Matan Kahana is just one example. Uh, Matan Kahana is a politician. I think that one one major way that we see right now of these uh, this rift is in politics, because uh, as I said, uh, Naftali Bennett is now. Um, uh, fulfilling the dream of many religious Zionist leaders along the years, and he he became the he became the chief. He's now prime minister, and from some reason, not only that, not not uh, the not all the religious Zionist community celebrates that moment, but Naftali Bennett finds every morning the uh, I would say the. Uh, the most vocal and fierce resistance within the Jewish, the, the religious Zionist community, such as uh, <clears throat> Bezalel Smotrich, which used to sit with him in the same political parties, but per political party, but now they are, in many ways, they are rivals, they are ideological rivals. And that means that all, uh, th there are two, I, I would say there is nothing except of maybe the, the settlements, but even that, I'm not sure, there's nothing these two politicians can agree on. Not on LGBT rights, not on, <clears throat> on uh, what it means to be <clears throat> religious Orthodox in Israel, not uh, regarding to women's role, not regarding the role of the chief rabbinate, not regarding <clears throat> uh, women recruiting the army, and I would say that these are, and religion and state in, in general, 
And these are the issues that uh, fulfills their, all their, um, th these are the issue that brings all the energy, the, the, the heat right now between the, those two. But it's not only, now let, let's get back a little bit to, to, the, to the national, to the national uh, uh, arena. In the national arena, also the, the issues are religion and state right now. Religion and state, the, the question of um, the question of the face of Judaism is the face of Judaism is uh, um, <clears throat> is uh, enforce, uh, enforcing some laws against I don't know Shabbat um, sh transportation on Shabbat. Uh, there is a real big question regarding the Kotel. Uh, uh, is the state of Israel going back to the settlement from 2016 and bringing, uh, giving the, um, or, or, or stating the Azrat Israel, which, and, and giving the Azrat Israel to the reform conservative and the Shota Kotel, the woman of the wall. It's a big, major question right now, which Matan Kahana deals with. And I think in the in the um, um, national national league uh, or national arena right now, these issues are extremely important, mainly because of the role of the Haredim. For I would say since 1977, Haredim, the the ultra orthodox parties, were part of most of the governments that were. Uh, established here in, in Israel um, for there was also a big shift, a big dramatic change during the during the time of Benjamin Netanyahu. He he brought the Haredim not only as partners in the government, in many ways they were the government. They were the government and they had the 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 legitimacy and um, um, the role was to uh, to um, um, to design the Jewish face of Israel, the Jewish face of Israel for the, its citizens. Questions of who is a Jew and what is a Jew was, in fact, for the Haredim to decide. And what happens right now? where the Haredim for, I would say, uh, dramatically, quite dramatically outside of the coalition, um, they see that as, I, I would say, quite surprisingly, when the Tim Lumim or part or half of the Tim Lumim are trying to design, <clears throat> to design uh, the question, the answers of what it means to be a Jew, what is a Jew? Matan Kahana just stated that he's, he's moving now for, to reform also the, the national conversion project and bringing oh, actually as well, again, uh, competition in, in a way privatization of this project. Matan Kahana is moving towards um, um, giving, um, um, I'm sorry, um, to uh, recognize women rabbis or women or ordinations in some ways in uh, under the the under the state of Israel. Um, but it's not only Matan Kahana. The the thing is that there is a new generations of politicians. Naftali Bennett and Matan Kahana from Yamina, but it's not only them. There are some politicians. Some of them trying to say they are the authentic representatives of the uh, religious Zionism, also in Yesh Atid and uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Gidon Sal's um, uh, party. So in some, the, there is a new generation of people in the politics, which refre reflects, I think, ref uh, something that happens deep inside the, the religious Zionist community. Uh, I will just say, where, where is it leading? Where is it going? Naftali Bennett's, I would say, status or, or horizon, political horizon is unknown because many, all his moves that, that he's, uh, the, the moves that he does uh, regarding religion and state in the, and, and, and Matan Kahane mainly 
um, there, uh, brings um, a fierce opposition. Not only that, that many people in the religious Zionist community are loyal to Netanyahu and they oppose very much Naftali Bennett's uh, moves. But what I'm trying to say is that the thing is not about, it's not about Naftali Bennett. I think Naftali Bennett represents something. Naftali Bennett, uh, maybe uh, Matan Kahana, uh, Elazar Steren, which, which he, he's from Yesh Atid, and he's also a minister. And he actually established the course of conversion within the army. I think they represent something new uh, in the religious uh, uh, community, which, uh, which uh, from time to time there are, there are politicians without rabbis. The, they decide for themselves. They state, we don't have rabbis. We, that's, that's the first time I, th I think that they state that we're, we're autonomous and we're, we're, uh, we are not afraid of uh, getting into a conflict with the religious uh, establishment, religious Haredi establishment. What I'm trying to say, if yeah, I can just, say, if you could wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, what I say is that for many years, um, people thought that uh, Israel, you know, it's a, it's a Jewish and democ democratic state. And between this, the, 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 there is a tension within the state of Israel. And I think for many years, we fought about the de democratic. And I think today, nowadays, we are fighting over the Jewish, the Jewishness, the Jewish identity. This is what leads the, the, the political parties right now. It's a moment. I'm not sure it's, uh, you know, history is a, is a cycle. Uh, but I think in, th in that moment, that what defines the, the lines, the fault lines within the politics. And it reflects things that have been going on for a long, long time within the religious Zionist community. Okay. Thank you so much, Yair. And as you can see, Yair has a wealth of knowledge and we asked him to keep it, uh, keep it on the short side. Um, just because we want to have a chance to also hear from you what interests you, you the, the, the audience. Um, so we will still have a chance to hear some more from you, and maybe in a more directed way, if you would um, uh, put your questions in the chat or ask them yourselves uh, later on. And um, now I, I want to uh, ask David to unmute again. And I want to invite you to talk about uh, what is the philanthropic work you do in the sector? And what would you like to see happening in this field from a, from a philanthropic point of view? Thank so David, at the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Yair. Um, and by the way, that's just a little plug. It's only 30 minutes or so that he spoke. So when the book comes out, you'll have plenty more to, uh, to delve into. Um, the Areno Foundation's initial strategy in the religious design this set field was based on the understanding that the sector is made up of three subsectors, the liberals, the silent majority in the center, and the conservatives, or the Khardal, which stands for Haredi Leumi, National Haredi. The goal was to strengthen the liberals, impact the silent majority mainstream, and attack the Khardal opponents. This somewhat militaristic concept was based on trying to attract one group, the silent majority, while repelling another, the Khardal. In 2019, the foundation engaged in a strategic process that led to a paradigm shift in how to fulfill its mission. Rather than looking at the Khardal subsector as our enemies that need to be defeated, we realized that we needed to engage with them rather than attack them. This conclusion was born out of several lessons. First was that our assumption that liberal organizations can single-handedly conquer, quote unquote, the silent majority mainstream and win them over is naive to say the least. The attacks on the Khardal didn't always lead to victory. Often our opponents dug in their heels and fought back with their own research projects PR campaigns, and use of social and traditional media. I felt that the situation was one in which the only people benefiting were the professionals who create the animations, post on social media, and the like. Both sides were spinning their wheels and stuck in the mud. The second lesson is the realization that there seems to be a lot of confusion about the terms moderate and liberal. Labeling our ideological opponents as extremists actually is a very unliberal thing to do. 
To be truly liberal or open-minded means to accept diversity. In other words, it is not okay for us to try to convert the Khardal to become liberal. That would make us guilty of trying to force our truth on them, which is exactly what we find problematic with their rhetoric. Therefore, we don't need to force the Khardal to abandon their worldview. We just need them to recognize that their worldview is not the only worldview. Another lesson I learned is that there are so-called liberals who are actually just as fanatic, extremist, and militant as some of the conservatives. Therefore, I have learned that being a moderate is a reflection on one's behavior and speech rather than on the actual ideological positions that one adheres to. So in theory, one can be an extremist liberal and another can be a moderate conservative. The Orenu Foundation continues to focus on the religious Zionist sector in Israel and on the synthesis of Jewish tradition and values alongside democracy, social justice, women's empowerment, and the relationship to the other. And we now have two strategies. The first is to strengthen this liberal subsector. In this space, we provide general support grants to Namanet Rabba Voda that advocates and promotes moderation and openness in the religious Zionist sector and acts to prevent radicalization by actively stirring conversation, raising awareness, spreading liberal modern orthodoxy, and advocating involvement and activism within the sector, and to Kolech, the orthodox feminist organization in Israel. We also fund Aluma and its program for religious girls who serve in the IDF, as Yair mentioned. And over the years, we have also funded the Beit Hillel rabbinic organization, B'nai Akiva Israel and Itim. The second strategy is to engage social change agents among the centrist and Khardal subsectors to undergo transformative processes and leadership programs to educate about complexity in terms of dealing with the modern world and reality. In other words, we want them to look at the world with more question marks than exclamation points. In this space, we fund three leadership programs. Number one is Shacharit Aribim Zelazeh that focuses on encounters with the other tribes in Israel as well as with the American Jewish community. The second is Yaakov Herzog Center's Beit Midrash Rashut Arabim that focuses on personal development and group dialogue related to the issues that divide the religious Zionist sector itself. And third is Yesodot's Beit Midrash Dorot that focuses on engaging the heads of the Khardal pre-army Mechinot with older alumni of this Mechinot who challenge their educational method, messages and methodologies in terms of how they prepare their students for the world. I believe that we are now in a liminal space defined as a place of transition, a season of waiting and not knowing. It is where all transformation takes place. Author and Franciscan friar Richard Rohr describes this space as, quote, where, where we are between the familiar and the completely unknown. There alone is our world, old world left behind. While we are not yet sure of the new existence, that's a good space where genuine newness can begin. Get there often and stay as long as you can by whatever means possible. This is the sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and a bigger world is revealed, end quote. With this in mind, I invite you to reflect on what is being said today and be open to learning more about the religious Zionist sector and how you can be involved. And please contact me to learn about our work and or the field. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to, um, yeah, I'm not on mute, okay. Um, Ruthie Saragosti is the planning director in Israel of UJA Federation of New York. And Ruthie, I would like to invite you to share with us um, the work that the UJA New York does in this sector and why you think it's important. So first of all, it's a real pleasure and honor to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Ruthie Sargassi. I've been with UJA Federation for five years now. Um, I'm the planning director, which means that uh, in the Israel office, in the Jerusalem office, uh, we're responsible basically among other things, for elevating new directions, pointing to important societal trends, things that we should be keeping our eyes on, um, and basically helping to navigate decision making with respect to content areas and directions that we should be taking. So a number of years ago, Ori Leventer Roberts and I, Ori was the previous director of the Israel office, we put on the radar of our professional and lay leadership the growing importance of the Datilo Me community on multiple facets of life in Israel in general and with respect to Jewish life um, in Israel in particular. We argued that if UJA sees itself as an important funder in Israel, 
which it does, that it's important that we learn about a segment of Israeli society that's gaining influence on the political, social, and cultural realms, even if that wouldn't translate into funding. It's, it was important for us that we go on an educate, you know, on a journey to educate ourselves, even if we knew that at the end of the day, it wouldn't end up with funding decisions. And I'll open a little parenthesis and say that UJA is a community foundation representing 50 plus thousand donors. So decision-making processes are qualitatively different than those of family foundations and private donors for reasons that I think are clear to everyone. So in the ways of the Federation, we embarked on a journey to learn more about the Zatilomi community. We invited community leaders to speak to us. We actually went on the ground to uh, Garin, Garin Torani, which are national religious um, intentional communities. Um, we went on a, a pretty in-depth learning journey on one of our missions where our late leadership came to Israel, all with the hope of gaining a better understanding of the significant role this community plays and the ways in which it's evolving. So we quickly realized what Yair and, and uh, David spoke about, that they're similar to just about every other population, there's a spectrum and that it's difficult to talk about the community without understanding that there are differences, sometimes significant and very, very substantive differences as, as the hearers spoke about and we heard about today. Probably the most pivotal moment for us was a panel discussion with five Dati Leomi women from across the spectrum. We had Rabbanit Tirza Kalman there, Maharat Avital Engelberg. Avital uh, received smicha from uh, Yeshiva Maharat in New York. For those of you who know, um, it's the first open Orthodox Yeshiva in North America to ordain women. And we had a Rabbanit Imbal Melav Melamed, who's the wife of Rabbi Melamed from Harbracha, which is considered a right-leaning hardline settlement. Um, and it was facilitated by Ori Lesser from Neymane Torah Vavoda that David just spoke about. For those who don't know, it's a central organization in this ecosystem, and it's a liberal national Zionist organization. So you can even imagine the electricity in the room that day. To this day, four years later, people still reference those very, very, very intense moments. In truth, the power of that session was in many ways accidental. All we really intended to do in that learning panel was to learn about the spectrum and decided to do it through women, mainly because we thought it would be more constructive to do it through women. No offense to all you wonderful men with us tonight. Not so much with the intention of elevating gender issues. It was, it was more a, a technical issue. But what happened was absolutely fascinating and turned into the highlight of the mission. Because while we went into that session wanting to do a deep dive into the Dati Leomi community, we realized from the intensity of the discussions that there were in fact deep, deep divides and that many of the issues, I would say many, many of the issues that were at the heart of the ideological and social divisions were in fact related to issues of women. In many ways, the issues that were raised, almost, I don't wanna say all issues because that would be extreme and not accurate, but in many, many cases, um, the, the once you sort of peeled the onion, at some point you'll find that at the core of the issue uh, are women. So I think in many ways, those realizations ended up animating people's imaginations and a lot of the work that we've done since then and we're doing now with the national religious um national zionist sector are actually related to the place of women and the role of women in the community so a few examples of what we've been involved with um Kolech, which is a um a liberal um, orthodox uh, organization for women, um, or rather focused on women. Funded, we funded a research study that was uh, done by Hagita Cohen Wolf on the readiness of the Datilomi communities for women's leadership. The idea was to learn from the research with the purpose of helping to set goals and objectives and to set strategy. Um, and after a pretty long and fascinating journey, there's actually going to be a whole spread about the findings um, in Makor Rishon um, in uh, the, the, the sector's newspaper in two weeks. So I don't want to spoil it for them, but they, they've been working on this for a couple of years. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you read what's in the papers, but I'll give a little spoiler and say that much to everyone's chagrin and probably no one is going to fall off their chairs. 
um, the preparedness of communities or the readiness of communities for a learned woman to be at the helm of the congregation is still not accepted by the vast majority, meaning that most communities are not prepared for a woman, no matter how learned, no matter how articulate or inspiring she may be, to be the halachic leader, meaning the rabbi of the community. On the other hand, almost across the board, there's overwhelming willingness and even interest for women to teach bat mitzvah groups and to be involved in the social and the cultural elements of the community, even taking leadership in those roles, but not more than that. And in the middle, as David called the silent majority, there is a lot of nuance and that and that's mainly what the research is hoping to shed light on, to understand the differences between Jerusalem and ROI, ROI being the rest of Israel. Um, what are the differences between the center and the peripheries, between Ashkenazi communities and Mizrahi communities? Are there differences between age, between um, uh, seniority of, uh, not seniority, but how old communities are, meaning are, in Israel, we have like these communities that are, are called, you know, they're being cultivated, they're, being, they're growing, and they're these established communities that have been there for um, forever. So are there differences that we ought to pay attention to so that we'll be able to make change in a, a, in, a, in a constructive and respectful way? And David, I really appreciated what you said about the difference between moderate versus uh, liberal. Um, all of our theories of change have been to try to understand uh, what, what we can do, what the situation is, and to try to work with um, needs from the ground. To be clear, the research was about the readiness of communities and not individuals, which is different, meaning that there are certainly communities that may not be ready that are home to individuals that are willing to accept and even embrace something different. So there is a nuance there between the readiness of communities and, um, and, and individual people who, for whom the research findings would be different had we gone about it in a different way. We were interested in community leadership and that's why we went with um, understanding communities. Another intervention we're currently supporting with Colech is to provide mentoring skills and tools and financial support to um, learned female leaders. Um, uh, which we're doing because in, in many ways, a lot of these women find themselves very alone um, and find themselves uh, needing support, emotional support. And there is a financial element to, as well in that um, many of these women do not have paid salaries or at least not uh, regular paid salaries that they could count on for uh, Parnassa for, for, you know, bringing home um, uh, something that they could live on. And therefore in that process where they're um, investing enormous amounts of time and attention and creativity in innovating and creating um, that there is a financial aspect of it as well that we're supporting. Um, to juxtapose that, just because this is a sort of a systemic way of addressing it, we also try to fund grassroots bottom up um, organizations like, for example, Chokhmat Nashim, which is uh, an organization run by a dynamo young woman by the name of uh, Shoshana Jaskal, who's taken it upon herself and her small grassroots organization to create the first stock photo site with high quality images highlighting Orthodox women and girls for use in the media and business in the nonprofit worlds. World, uh, worlds. They're doing this as, as, as a reaction to counter what they call the erasure um, and marginalization of women in the public sphere. So they've set out to literally put women back into the picture, uh, literally. So to renormalize and re-centralize Jewish women in the community. They claim that when women are not seen, their voices are not heard and their needs are therefore not met. So this is a grassroots community effort by the community for the community. Um, Shoshana inspired 200 people to volunteer. There are 200 volunteers from around the Jewish world to take this on. And I'll Ruthie, give one last Ruthie. example. Okay, yeah. one last thing one because last I example. want to leave some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one last example. Um, and I won't elaborate because uh, both Yair and David talked about it. Um, we're giving a grant now to Hadar for the su supporting um, again, and doing capacity building around egalitarian Minyanim and Minyanim Meshatfim, which are a little bit different. Um, they're on the spectrum of uh, liberal um, Minyanim that are encouraging the participation, active participation, uh, and sometimes leadership of women. Um, and so I'll just end to say that 
our support comes from two two main ideas. One is that where there is really, you know, not able to support and express themselves and express their Judaism in a way that they're comfortable and and is meaningful to them, then we want to support them. And the second is very much in line with what Yair is saying, which is that if there is an assumption that um, that the Dati Lomi community is, is, is an important one and that its evolution has ramifications not only within the confines of, of uh, the Dati Lomi community, but to Israel in all, then um, there are implications, uh, obviously, to the vibrancy and strength of Judaism and Israel in general. Yes. Great. Thank you, Ruthie. Fascinating. Um, so um, we're now going to uh, pin the three of you, the three speakers, uh, we're going to pin them as a panel. And uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, we'll take, take questions from the audience. And also we'll see if there's maybe a discussion between the three, but we're first of all going to take uh, questions from the audience. And there were actually a few in the chat. So uh, if, you're, um, if you're interested in asking something, you can also raise your hand if you want to ask it. Uh, um, yourself, and otherwise I'm going to read questions from the chat. So there was a question from, uh, for Yair. Um, the Haredi community has a disproportional impact on the religious Zionist community, but they're also xenophobic, extreme- Hardal, Hardal community. I didn't write Haredi. Oh, on the religious Zionist community, sorry has a disproportional impact on the religious Zionist community. But they're also xenophobic, extreme in many ways, and in some ways a threat to civil society. Can they be tipped back into the more moderate religious Zionist community? And if so, how? Um, you know, in, for many years, uh, people are looking at the, the Tilumi community. Now I, I know I can say the Tilumi because I'm breaking teeth with religious Zion. Okay, the Tilu, looking at the, the Tilumi uh, in terms of radicalization, haktsana, and moderatization, I don't know, or, or being moderate, more moderate. And what I think is that the, the main key to understand what's going on is not haktsana and uh, hitmatnut or being uh, a, a more uh, an extreme or or the opposite. I think the, the the main key to understand is that there is a privatization, and 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 people are moving towards more extreme views, as well as other people moving to the other direction. And I think this is not a the right question. The the right question of you know bringing them together. I think it's. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, the chances are not high, but, but I think people ought to think differently. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a one movement. It's not one ideological movement anymore. And uh, if, we're, if we're talking about the, you know, the, the coalitions, the Khardalim right now are in coalition with the Likud and Khardalim. It's not only in politics. It's also in the religious life, in their... Uh, state of mind in many ways, uh, and I think, you know, I think it's okay, because as long as you separate, as, and, and everyone does, I mean, his own uh, thing, and uh, doesn't control the other, or try to, I don't know, to, uh, uh, um, um, I don't know, I, I mean, the, let, let me just say, in, in many, all aspects of life, right now, it's separate, it's almost separate, uh, schools, yeshivot, synagogues, almost everything, and now even the political party. There used to be a Baita UD, which was uh, the Mafdal before, which was the, the, the Tilumi party. It doesn't exist anymore, and it doesn't, uh, even on the paper, it doesn't exist. And there is no one rabbi who rules the whole community, and that's okay. I think the, the one challenge is in the, the Tilumi education system, which called the Chemed, uh, over there, there is a real, and you see that, you really see that every day, there is a struggle between two forces uh, uh, and the, do, the, the domination of, of, uh, of the Chardal is very clear over there. Uh, some challenges, some places in Jerusalem, it's easier to be, uh, to, uh, to, um, 
uh, to start a school which is more liberal or to, uh, to run a school which is more liberal. In other places, it's more difficult. I just want to add one, uh, I just want to add one really important point that I forgot, and this relates to the Hardal. The fact is that the Hardal uh, could be divided themselves into at least two subcategories, which is the, the original Hardal of Berkazarav and the Kav uh, of Rav uh, uh, Har Hamor, run by Rav Tau. Um, there's a great book in Hebrew by Yair Shelig called the Hardalim. Um, they don't, by the way, like to call themselves Hardal, they like to call themselves Torani. Um, but that's a whole, in other words, every time you look, and if you look within it, the, the exact example of uh, what uh, Ruthie talked about, Din Baal Malamed, her husband was the one who was willing to be on the panel with the French uh, uh, female, um, uh, what is it, reform rabbi? I can't remember her name. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, he, and he got a huge amount of flack. There was, um, so he's Hardal, but he was open to sitting on a panel. The, the ones that I, so in other words, within the Hardal, there is definitely a group which is extreme, which I would call Rav Tau and his yeshiva, but even his students, when they have to engage in the real world and the programs they're running are open to dealing with the real world. And that's through some of the things we've been involved in. And so I think that we need to recognize that if we can really push the or, or reduce the amount that are actually acting and behaving or speaking in an extreme way to a minimum, then we can also uh, help strengthen that center and the and the moderates. Um, I'm conscious of the time. So um... We're going to go a few minutes over, if uh, that's okay. And if you have to leave, then uh, then we understand. I'm but, really uh, sorry. I, Could I just say, I absolutely yes. need to leave because I have a mission of New, oh. my New York leadership coming in a few days okay. and have an urgent meeting. Okay. I'm so, really sorry. Okay, so if you have to leave, then, uh, then that's okay. Uh, Ruthie, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate, appreciate you being here today. It's and uh, bye, thank Ruthie. You. Okay, so um, uh, actually, I, I just wanted to take one more question from. There seems to be a lot of similarity between the role of Orthodox women in roles of spiritual leadership here in North America and in Israel. Have there been efforts to bridge the two? Yes, I mean, the, there is one really important thing to understand on the, 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 the Tilumi community here and, and Jewish life here are mostly synagogues, synagogues are owned by their um, um, people, by their community. It's not owned by not the state of Israel, but not even a movement. There is no uh, the Tirumi movement. There is no rabbinate. There is, it's not like the, uh, I don't know, the OU or the uh, Young Israel or Reform or Conservative Movement. It's not the, it's not, it's, it's private privatized uh, uh, deeply, I mean, from, from the origin. This is, and, and the, the question is, I mean, and many synagogues, and the, when you see the trends, the, the, all the spectrums of things that happened in many synagogues in Israel have no rabbi, have no rabbi. This is really uh, uh, weird for people from America to understand but, or to hear, but it's, there is no rabbi. It's, it's, it's more democratic in, in many ways, mainly in the Tatilumi community it's it's been a long time way way before i mean uh, it was forever like that some some synagogues has rabbi and some not and now the question is um some people will argue also that the authority of rabbis were was never as it was in the haredi community or even in the reformed community it's not it's not the same it's more autonomous uh I mean, in, in the DNA, in its DNA. Now, the question is, if, if, um, if you have a woman leading a synagogue in Israel, it's, it's very unusual because people have to pay for that. The, the community doesn't, it's not, it's not a job. It's not a day job. It's not something that you, it's, it's not a real uh, thing that people, many people do. You have to be a teacher or a rabbi elsewhere. It's not something that you, uh, you leave from, from being a rabbi. So this is just something that I, I have to say that all the things that are, uh, most of the things that are happening here are beginning uh, bottom up. That's, that's, uh, that's, the, that's one, one uh, thing to understand. And uh, if there is a bridge, I think there is a bridge. There is a community. The community is one thing that uh, we didn't touch so many things, but uh, for instance, the, the, um, the Facebook or Twitter or, uh, or or organizations. It's a, it's a small world. It's a smaller world than it used to be. 
Uh, and I think many people from, from both sides of the ocean knows each other, activists knows, knows each other, and it's really important. I think the support between the two uh, groups is important uh, and crucial. Thank you. Um, it really feels like the tip of an iceberg. Yeah. And uh, it's a pity to cut it short, but we, we, we hope that we can, if there's interest, we hope that we can uh, bring people together again to talk about this topic. Um, before we go, I want to invite those of you who live in uh, Israel, we can continue talking about, uh, uh, we talked a lot about gender equality today. And um, I want to invite those of you who live in Israel on Friday, December 10th, we will have an, a conversation about the impact of putting a gender lens on philanthropic giving with Michal Herzog, who's Israel's first lady, and she'll be the keynote speaker. And it will be hosted by Daphna Meitar. I'm putting the link in the chat right now. So anyone who would like to um, uh, RSVP for that, you are very welcome. And with that note, uh, I would like to thank Yair again and David Roth for uh, initiating this program. And hopefully we'll be able to continue talking about this important topic. Thank you all for being here and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.